Hello everybody. Today I'm going to present some of the work that I did in my fifth year project at the Higher Institute for Applied Sciences and Technology in Syria. It's concerned with the study of visual serving algorithms for assisted grasping of a prosthetic arm. It's presented by me, Asha Farah, supervised by two of my professors, Dr. Shadi Albitar, Dr. Al Amaru, and two engineers, Mr. Nizar Falyon and Mr. Ahmed Ali. The figure right here shows the project overall flowchart. Here we have a robot manipulator with a camera attached to its end effector in what we call an eye in hand configuration. As the arm moves, the camera is going to take images of the object that we are trying to grasp. And it's going to extract some of the features of this image. We're going to call these features F. Now these features are going to be compared to some reference features, F star, which are features extracted from the image showing the object in the desired grasping position which the arm is trying to reach. Now we're going to compute the error between these features. We're going to feed them into an IBVS control block. As we see here, it's an image-based visual server controller, which is going to give us some commands on how the arm should move. Now the execution of these reference commands are to be left to the joint controller subsystem right here, which is going to issue the appropriate actuating signals to the arms motors to perform this reference command issued by the IBVS control block. Now, what you're really interested in in this project is the joint controller subsystem, which we're going to discuss first, and then the IBVS control loop, which we're going to discuss later on. Now, the figure here shows the real arm in our control lab, which was designed by engineer Zafaliu as part of his master's thesis. Now we see right here there is an Arduino card here that is performing the low-level control of the seven servo motors that are controlling the arm's movement. Here at the end effect we have a gripper for the for grasping objects. The motors are two types, the RX28 motors, which are used in the first three joints, and the AX12A motors, which are used in the last four joints, so it's a seven degrees of freedom redundant robot manipulator. This right here shows the arm's dynamic model in the simscape environment in Simulink. We're going to use this model to first test part of our control algorithms and identification processes to just verify our theoretical models of this arm. As usual, we first start with the modeling and identification of the robot manipulator at hand. Now we derive the forward kinematic model, the velocity kinematics, and the dynamic model as well using modern screw theory, which is really heavily relied upon in this project. Now the two figures here show part of the test to make sure that the forward kinematic model was actually accurate. So what we did is that we moved the arm in the simscape environment using some sinusoidal joint projectors and we tracked the end effectors x and y positions as can be seen here. So we actually then compared the measured values of the x coordinates and the y coordinates with those predicted by our forward kinematic model. And as can be seen from these graphs, the results are really, really close, which means that our theoretical models are actually accurate. Now next, we did the same test, which we moved the arm in the same environment and then measured the resulting end effector x and y velocities and compared them to those predicted by our screw analysis and for the velocity kinematics. As can be seen, the x and y velocity values are quite close, again confirming the validity of our model. So the same thing was also done for the dynamic modeling, in which we compared the measured load torque values on the joints to those that actually were computed using our theoretical dynamic model. Now the initial data of the arm species were actually taken from a SOLIDWORKS model, also designed by engineer Nizar Falyun, and we tried as much as possible to match the used material in our simscape environment to that used in the real fabrication of the arm to get results as close as possible to those seen in practical situations. As can be seen, the two graphs are actually really close, we here show the torque for joint one and joint three. 
Now that we have discussed the modeling and identification of the studied arm, we're going to move on to velocity control, which is one of the classical control methods used in robot arms. So the first idea is that this figure shows a PI velocity control loop of a robot arm in which we measure the robot's joint values here, theta, using the encoders. We compare those to a desired reference trajectory for the angles. This gives us the error, which is then fed to a typical PI controller. This is actually added then to a feed forward term, which is the derivative of the reference trajectory. These are then issued as velocity commands to the robot arm. So this kind of control is probably very much popular in commercial robot arms in which the actuators used are more of like servo type motors, in which we can give a velocity command at any time step. The figure right here shows the results of a PI velocity control loop for joint one of the studied arm in this escape environment. Right here, we're trying to track a sinusoidal velocity reference. Now, the figure right here shows many of the pitfalls of the velocity control discussed earlier. Mainly, we can see that the tracking curve actually degrades near the peaks of the reference signal. Now, this is due to us neglecting the masses and inertial properties of the arm's length, which make the arm actually behave differently than expected. This actually condemns us to look for different type of control algorithms that utilize the dynamic model of the arm. This is what we would like to call the torque control, which will be discussed next. Now in torque control, we're going to utilize the arm's dynamic model to create a higher accuracy tracking performance. Now this assumes that the arm's actuators actually accept a torque command or at the lower level, they have a current control loop. Computed torque control is one of the most famous torque control algorithms, which is the type of feedback linearization technique, where we choose the torque command as follows. Now, M theta is the arm's inertial matrix, V is an auxiliary control, H is a vector that encompasses the gravity torque terms and the Coriolis acceleration terms. Now, the auxiliary control V can be designed using various methods, for example, a feed forward PID control law as follows. Or it can be designed using a sliding mode control, which is discussed in the project's report. Now, the figure here shows the torque control results for position tracking of joint one using a sinusoidal reference. Now, here we utilize two different types of algorithms a linear one and a robust one. In the linear algorithm, we designed the auxiliary control using a BID controller, as in the previous slide. And in the robust algorithm, we designed the auxiliary controller using a sliding mode type controller, which is described in detail in the report. We can see that both actually achieve really high position tracking accuracy, with the robust one achieving extremely high accuracy, even outperforming the linear control. Now, the problem with the previous torque control method that we just discussed is that the arm that is available in our control lab does not support torque commands. This means that we cannot just utilize the previous method to compute torque commands and send them to the actuators because there's no way of achieving or making sure that this torque is actually tracked. This means that we have to try to find some methods that try to compensate for the dynamic effects of the arm at the level of velocity or position, which are actually available at the servo motors. Now, this is what we refer to as dynamic compensation. We're going to discuss two types of methods. One that is actually model dependent, which utilizes the redundancy of the arm. The other is model free methods, which are of two types. One utilizes RL agents, and the other one utilizes what we call an adaptive neural sliding mode control. So, first of all, we're going to discuss the model dependent methods, and we're going to talk about redundancy resolution. So, our arm actually has seven motors, seven joints while the end effector only has six degrees of freedom, meaning that we have an extra degree of freedom that can be utilized to achieve auxiliary tasks while still tracking a prescribed end effector trajectory. Now, this type of control is called redundancy resolution, which is usually solved at the position or the velocity levels. Now, the idea that we went after is that since our servos do not accept torque commands and only have velocity and position control loops, the arm's inertial properties or dynamic effects actually appear as disturbance torques affecting these control loops. The higher the disturbance torque, 
the lower the performance of this <coughs> control loop. So what we're trying to do is that we're going to, to move the arm in a certain trajectory while trying to minimize the torque affecting the joint motors by utilizing the redundancy of the arm. This means that we're trying to minimize a function of the disturbance torque affecting the joint motors. The cost function that we finally use is given by the following relation, which is a weighted magnitude or weighted norm of the torque vector. To test the idea of this redundancy resolution scheme, we implemented the algorithm in the Senscape environment and compared it against the original method without any compensation whatsoever. We commanded the arm to move on a certain end effector trajectory, and this figures right here show the absolute trapping error on the x coordinate of the end effector frame. Now, here we can see that the compensated me method actually achieves a static trapping error of nearly 1.5 millimeters on the x coordinate which is slightly better than the 2 to 2.5 millimeter error achieved by the original uncompensated method. Now, although this is actually only a minor enhancement, it serves to show that our method actually aims to enhance the, the tracking performance of the control loops. Now we move to model-free control methods that do not utilize the arms dynamic model or even an estimation of the dynamic model in any form. The first method utilizes a reinforcement learning agent in a scheme that is called the reference compensation technique. In this case, we do not just send the reference signal to the robot's internal actuator controllers. We also add a correction term to this reference signal to try to compensate for the dynamic effects. Now, the job of the RL agent is to try to learn this correction through experience, utilizing only the error between the measure and the reference joint values. The second model free control method that we used was actually the adaptive neural sliding mode controller. In this case, we estimate the system's dynamic model online using a one layer radial basis function neural network. Now, the basis functions that we used were actually Gaussian. In this case, we assume that the system's model is actually in a phi form, which means that the second derivative of the state is a function f of the state plus b multiplied by u, which is the control input. The neural network is also trained online using a Kalman filter to capture different variances in the model. For example, if the arm start, decides to pick a certain load, there's going to be a change in the dynamic model, and in this case, we will be able to recognize it. Now, what's going to happen next is that we're going to use this estimated model of the system to design a sliding mode control using this estimation. This right here would prove to be a model-free control as we do not utilize in any shape or form any estimation of the arm's dynamic model. Now, the figure here shows the comparison of results of the two model-free methods as compared to the original method that only utilizes the arm's internal actuators. This right here shows an absolute tracking error of joint one only in the original and the RL method and the adaptive neural sliding mode controller. Now in the original method, we see that the absolute tracking error nearly reaches about 0.02 or even more. In the RL method, this kind of dropped to 0.01 to 0.015 approximately. Now here we can see that the adaptive neural sliding mode controller actually reduced that error drastically to nearly 0 0.005 in absolute magnitude, meaning that this method actually provided the most accurate control performance out of all the compensation methods discussed so far. Now we're going to move to talk about the visual surfing part of the project. Now this right here is a reminder of the project's overall flowchart. Now we're going to talk about the IBBS control block right here, which is a type of visual servering control that utilizes errors in the feature. This right here shows the IBBS overall control flow chart. Now, this starts right here in the grasping planner, which actually gives an image with reference features that describe the desired grasping position of the object that the arm now sees. Now, what's going to happen is that this is going to be compared against features that are actually tracked and extracted from the image 
using the KLT algorithm to produce what we'd like to call the error feature map. Now we're going to compare the magnitude of this feature vector. If it's less than a certain threshold, we're going to end. If not, we're going to compute the velocity command this time using the IPBS control log, which are then sent to the lower level actuators of the R. Now the first method that is used in computing the control law in all IBBS methods is to compute what we would like to call the interaction matrix LS, given by the derivative of the feature vector with respect to R. R is a vector representing the camera's position in space. Now the velocity command that's actually issued to the R is given by this relationship right here, which is lambda with the pseudo inverse of LS the interaction matrix multiplied by the error in the features. Now, one of the most famous feature vectors in visual survey is actually feature points. That is, we compare certain feature points on the object against reference features and the desired grasping position of the same object. Now, this right here is the interaction matrix using these feature points, which is a function of u and v, that is the coordinates of the point in the current image plane in pixels. Now, there's also rho u, rho v, and f are all intrinsic camera parameters, and z is an estimation of the point's depth in three-dimensional space. Now this right here shows a simulation result of the IBVS control using the studied arm with a camera attached to its end defector. Now the blue square right here shows the desired feature locations, and the red one shows the image currently seen by the arm. Now this is a highly simplified example but it's only for a demonstration. In this case, we use a constant depth of 0.1 meters. Now this right here shows the same simulation, but under the assumption that Z is equal to 0.5 meters, we can see that the control also converged to the desired feature locations, which means that the classical IPVS using feature points is actually highly robust to point depth estimation. Now for the practical results, this right here shows a picture of the object that we're trying to grasp. We plan to grasp a cylindrical object. In this case, we attached a checkerboard-like feature on, the, on this object, and we designated four points for tracking. This right here shows point one in yellow, and the red dots are actually the reference points that we are trying to reach in a certain grasping position. Now this right here shows the response on the x and y coordinates of point one that was actually shown in the previous slide. It can be seen that it actually takes about seven to eight seconds to reach satisfactory error results of nearly 0.1 pixels and in this case nearly two pixels. Now this was only using a proportional controller for the IBVS part. Now these results were only preliminary as we couldn't have much more time to fine tune the controller and use more sophisticated controllers. For example, we could have added an integral term to try to eliminate the static error. We could have used more robust methods, for example, like sliding mode, to ensure a higher robust control accuracy. Now, this value concludes the project. In this project, we actually tackled the detailed modeling of the Zimin DOS manipulator. We discussed the classical control methods, as in velocity control and computed torque control. We also highlighted the problem that is actually present in the ARM designed in our control lab, mainly that it does not accept torque commands, which prompted us to discuss some advanced control algorithms to compensate for these dynamic effects that are actually ignored in the case of our ARM in the lab. We then studied visual serving algorithms and actually performed a practical experiment to validate the IBVS control method using only a proportional control. And that's it. Thank you for listening.